The first day I was kind of nervous, but you know, so many people came over here, interviewed me before I got to Washington. So I, I got a little used to, but I never been in a big crowd like that to demonstrate these uh, things, you know, as the thing. But after cup, one day, I was okay. That, I think, is the craziest question that um, ever came my way. Is, are these real? You know, pointing out to the flowers, they say, yeah, they're real. Yeah, but they don't look real. They look plastic. I said, no, they're real. They're real. Every summer, the Smithsonian Institution and the National Park Service hold a festival on the National Mall in the shadow of the Washington Monument. The event is called the Festival of American Folklife. It's a celebration of the diverse ethnic and cultural traditions of America. Visitors get to meet and to talk with people from different backgrounds, from different places. The 1989 festival featured people from a place whose very name has come to mean ethnic and cultural diversity. Our flora today in Hawaii, very much like our people, <laughs> mixed up, chop suey, you know, from all over the world. And, and the neat thing is that they're compatible. You know, they live well together. Marie McDonald is a laymaker. She was one of more than 100 people from Hawaii invited to the festival, all selected by the Smithsonian to share the rich diversity of Hawaii's folk life. We make shortened ones that we wear around our wrists, you know, so. You wear them around your ankles, too. Around our ankles, too. Yeah. Well, you know, we didn't have any precious stones, you know, to make oh. a jewelry with, you know, to ornament our bodies. So we used the flowers, you know, and the natural material that we had. The laymaker is home now on the 10-acre nursery that she and her husband have in the rolling hills of South Kohala on the Big Island. Here, they grow the flowers and other plants found in some of Hawaii's most beautiful lays. Since coming home, she's had a chance to think about the festival. I'll tell you, one of the neatest experiences I had there was this little girl that came on the first day. And her name was Sarah. And she, she came with a grandmother. And she stood in front of my table there with her, you know, like this, and, and watched very quietly. Her grandmother said, I'll leave you. And she ran off to look at something else. Came back, are you ready to go? She just sat there. and. Um, she stayed there for about two hours just watching. I chatted with her a little bit, you know, and asked her if she would like to try one of these. And she said, sure, we have a nice garden. I'm going to try some. So she went home. And I, I didn't think anything about it. I thought, well, this little girl is going to go home and try this simple technique, because I showed her a simple one. She was about 11 years old. She came back on the last day. I, you know, she said, I tried it. And I didn't even know, I didn't recognize the girl when she came back the last day. And I looked down and I said, you tried, you tried what? She said, I tried to make this lay. She said, I can. And I said, did you bring it with you? She says, no, but it wasn't the best lay, but I can do it. And I think, like you said, if I practice, I can be good. You know, so that was a neat experience. There I really shared something and somebody got something out of it. You know, this little girl, cute little girl. <laughs> Esther Makua Ole learned as a little girl how to weave the leaves of the pandanus into bracelets and hats and baskets. Visitors not only were interested in her skill, but also in the language she and her assistant spoke, one not often heard even in Hawaii. 
mai kai ho i ke ma ke ma ke o i ho o lo he ho i ka hi mea ma ko o lo lo ho i he just told me you wanted to hear more Hawaiian and I told him aole which is no only because she's being a rascal no I told her I I thank you then I'll ask him the next question nui ka po e ma ane i ke i la now your turn to interrupt. She says, oh, there's plenty of people coming today, huh? Yeah, and there's going to be more. A million people would visit the festival during the 10 days it was held, Governor John Waihei among them. The Smithsonian had approached the governor with the idea of featuring Hawaii in the 1989 festival to mark the state's 30th anniversary in the Union. The governor endorsed the idea, and that led to the commitment of nearly a million dollars by the state and private industry to pay for it. Asians have a tendency of leaving their shoes at the doorway. Kenichi Tasaka was a major contributor to the festival, not with money, but with his presence. He makes sandals from bulrushes like his father before him. The father learned how in Japan. The Nisei son didn't learn until he was 83. The sandal maker is now 92 and the oldest at the festival. Because of his age, he asked the Smithsonian also to invite his son-in-law. He could talk with visitors while the old man worked. Looks very comfortable. In an Asian family, where if you had your slipper assigned to you, and these are the same, if you had it put on the floor, you could identify your, your slippers by the color. Different colors are used to match the pair, so if you got 10 pairs, you can find yours without having to wait all day. Right, right, right. My daughter has some earrings, Christy, the earrings that are made out of the, the bull rush. Oh, shoe design. Yes. Oh, that's cute. It's a little shoe. <laughs> oh, here they are on the table. Yeah, there's some here. When he's not gathering bulrushes along Kauai's north shore, the sandal maker can be found in the workshop behind his house in Hanalei. He jokingly says the festival has created too much interest in his hobby. Since I was there making slipper, I have more orders from Honolulu. They call me on the telephone, and somebody from mainland, they want they want me to send for them. You know, they pay the postage and everything, but I cannot make fast enough, fast enough. No one at the festival worked harder than Thomas Kamaka Emsley. It's incredible what, uh, that it's such a natural and abundant rock form for them. And it's so easy to work with. Plus the fact it makes a beautiful, uh, makes a beautiful surface when it's done. Onlookers don't realize that the rocks are not Hawaiian. The Smithsonian wanted to respect tradition and not take lava rocks from Hawaii. So similar rocks were found in Idaho and shipped to Washington. This is really well done. Wall building and everything else ended early the first day. Mid-afternoon, it rained for two hours. The unscheduled Hawaiian blessing would leave the exhibit area wet and muddy for several days, but visitors would not seem to mind. They have all those slashes on it. They ruined it, didn't they? Or are they going to paint over it? Yeah. Or they're probably going to smoothen it off or something. Yeah. Cut it off. Hold your ears, this is going to be loud.
canoe builder was a big favorite. He was shaping a log of Hawaiian koa into a small outrigger canoe. While he worked, an assistant answered questions. Is that that tool? Did he design that himself? Yeah, he calls it the termite. <laughs> it's like a high-speed ads. Cedar? No, it's much harder than cedar. It's called koa. The worms don't eat it. Yeah, I, I suppose his grandfather used a handmade tool. <laughs> you know it. He had his father, and you know, of course they used stone oh. in the ancient times to cut it with basalt adzes and axes. Now, is this the boat, and another piece will be the, the out part? Or well, what he'll do here outrigger? is he'll shape out, he'll rough out the shape of the hull, uh -huh. and he'll have the inside hollowed out, and it'll be very close to completely finished. And then see the big sections of wood just there under the, the photograph? Uh -huh. Those will be the deck sections, called manu, and afterwards he'll put gunnels on it, and then fasten the interior structures and put the seats on. And it'll look like the canoe inside the tent when it's done. Oh, and then he's going to take it down to the Potomac. <laughs> Koa canoe building is something of a dying art. Wright Bowman is one of only a few people still doing it. He does it in his spare time at the canoe shed at Kamehameha schools. It's here that he's literally invented his own tools and techniques. A lot of visitors at the festival wanted to know about that. You see, on the East Coast, they have a lot of boat builders. And um, they were impressed with all my the tools that I did bring. And I would tell them of some other stuff that I developed. And they were quite interested. Many questions of uh, how did I, you know, technical questions. I would explain to them how I use my tools. and. So they were impressed with uh, that part of it. My father was born in Hawaii in the late 1800s. Someone had the idea and, uh, of building an imaginary country store and then having the folks from Hawaii take turns sitting out front and talking. Visitors learned a lot about island life this way. Uh, like anybody else, you, uh, you fight for survival. And survival is you have to work to get money to feed the family and take care of everything. So. Uh, my father opened a Chinese restaurant in the late uh, 1940s. And so all of us in the family worked in the restaurant. When my older brother uh, was old enough to learn. Visitors must have liked the idea. There always was a crowd in front of K. Ava Grocery. Leo de Gario Reno later would have his turn in front of the store. He would talk about learning to weave coconut leaves as a boy in the Philippines and how he came to Hawaii to work in a sugar mill. Now he's retired from the mill, but his hobby keeps him nearly as busy, making hats and baskets for friends and teaching anyone interested. He does it all for just a smile. If anyone enjoyed the festival more than the weaver of coconut leaves, you'd be hard pressed to find him. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Long before Filipino immigration to Hawaii, there were the missionaries from New England. They brought with them a kind of weaving tradition, quilting. Island women went on to create a unique folk life tradition of their own. Hawaiian quilts, all the patterns, do have a symbolic meaning. They do. Uh -huh. Mi'ali'i Kalama is herself a quilt. Caucasian on her father's side, Polynesian on her mother's. The culture back of that in Hawaiian is the quilts are made uh, to be used on the bed. And if you were to lay your quilt on the bed with the seam in the middle, it means a division between husband and wife. The quilter is a pastor at Kava'i Ha'o Church. She also teaches quilting classes here. She often encounters the same reaction from people when they hear her name. The people at the festival were no exception. Coming from Hawaii, they expected to see a brown-skinned person. And here I was with a Hawaiian name, Mealii Kalama, and they wanted to know how much of a Hawaiian was I then I had to explain that my mother 
was pure Hawaiian, but my father was an Englishman. And so, and this is why I'm half brown and half white. <laughs> While the young woman from Kauai quietly went about her work, the Reverend Dwayne Pang not so quietly went about his. The Reverend is conducting a ceremony to bless a new lion for a traditional Chinese lion dance. The ritual involves bringing the lion to life with a symbolic drop of blood from a rooster, a special animal to the Chinese. Most of the crowd was unaware of all the symbolism, but it didn't seem to matter. It was just interesting to watch. Visitors to the festival knew there were Chinese in Hawaii, but many did not know there also were cowboys. Robert Ruiz is a firefighter by profession, but a cowboy at heart. He grew up on a ranch in Kauai and learned how to make saddles. He's got quite a reputation for his skill and demand for his saddles. His partner at the festival is a real-life cowboy. Henry Silva rides the range in upcountry Maui, branding, fencing, and shoeing horses. He's become well-known in upcountry for his rawhide braiding. Other ranch hands provide the rawhide, and he provides them with ropes and whips. It's a four-braid rope. This is an eight-braid ring. And that's a six-braid whip. And that's an eight-braid rope. It's all made out of cowhide. You know what is cowhide? The shy, soft-spoken cowboy is back on the ranch now, where the horses outnumber the people, where he's more comfortable. At first, he did not want to go to Washington. You see, Henry Silva had never left Hawaii before. But his wife and friends changed his mind, and he's glad they did. Now there's something this tough cowboy will never forget. When I was with the children, I think. Yeah, I think it was. Had son that, like a little boy. He really hit me, that little boy. He couldn't talk or hear what, you know, the sign language. And gee, when I was talking to him, I didn't know, see. And uh, I guess he was always he was watching up there, and I seen this woman, you know, giving that sign language. And, and by that, we made him rope the thing. So that, you know, really hit me. How did you learn to do this? Lisa Hiroi learned how to make dolls as a little girl in Japan. After the war, she brought her skill to Hawaii. She got a job as a dishwasher and later owned her own restaurant, all the time continuing to make dolls. It was not until 30 years later that someone gave her a doll from China made of paper. Lisa Hiroi studied the doll and soon was making her own. She's never again used expensive fabric for her dolls, only paper. The dolls are nonetheless exquisite. People patiently waited every day for their turn in front of Wa Chan Tom, the calligrapher. He was not only demonstrating his ancient craft, he was giving away free samples. 
Chinese proverbs from the hand of the master. May your life be as lofty as the southern mountains. May your fortune be as deep as the eastern sea. And for young entrepreneurs, one charmingly Chinese. May the turnover of your merchandise be as speedy as revolving wheels. The calligrapher is a retired businessman. He's now 86 and lives in Makiki. He was a little boy in Chinese school in Honolulu when teachers noticed his talent. He's quite proud of all the attention his talent got at the festival. Oh, I think they're impressed greatly. And they're curious more than anything else about how I am going to construct the different words, different characters, and how I place, how I can swing my brush from left to right, and all the time putting it in the right position instead of measuring off slowly. So they're all curious, the construction of the words and how fast I can finish it. And I won't go in. Food certainly is an important part of folk life traditions. Visitors got to see the preparation of a pig for a luau to roast in what may have been the first emu ever dug on the National Mall. There were several food demonstrations, including one using a Portuguese forno or earthen oven. This one was built by the Smithsonian from plans provided by Manuel Correa of Oahu. He said they did a pretty good job. Manuel Correa was baking loaves of Portuguese bread prepared by his wife. This is how the Correas spoiled their six children who refused to eat bread from a store. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kalua Pig, Hawaiian style. The canoe builder's work was going along smoothly so that he had more time to talk shop. It was tapered in, so when I put my patch in, it doesn't fall through. Okay, I just so, put so it, it in locks into like a 45 yeah. degree angle, or, another, no, or 30 degrees. degrees. Pardon? Five degrees. Oh, just five degrees? Yeah, okay, so, so it's almost... Real, okay, a lot of bearing surface. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. Do you pre-cut your patch before you put it on? Sometimes I do. I, I usually make the opening, then I make yeah, the... Yeah, then you trim it around. ...all table saw work. Yeah. It would take Wright Bowman more than a 10-day festival to build a canoe by himself. So the Smithsonian shipped one of his canoes to Washington for visitors to see and touch. Visitors also came to hear. They were fascinated by the variety of island music and dance. Thank you. 
The Festival of American Folklife has been held every year since 1967. Someone has described it as a symbol of our ability as a nation to find unity in our diversity. It makes us proud of who we are, and it's through that appreciation of who we are that we appreciate others. I think they got to see what life was really like, and they were impressed with it. Because, you know, one guy says to me, how come I w I've been in Hawaii three times, and how come I never saw these things? Well, that's because you went to the other side of the island. That was the answer we gave them. You were on the other side of the island. If you came to our side of the island and you attended our festivals, you know, and, and you uh, joined in our parties, you know, the local people, the people who live there, then you would have seen these things. Aohi o kahi nana o luna o kapali. Iho mai alolo ne. Ike ike ao nui ke ao ike. He alo. Don't look at us from the top of the cliff. Come down here and learn of the big and little currents face to face. Oh,